The highway stretched out before me like an endless ribbon of asphalt disappearing into the darkness of the night. Behind the wheel of my rig, I navigated the empty road with practiced ease, the hum of the engine and the rhythm of the tires on pavement, the only companions in the silent night. As I drove, the scent of diesel fuel hung heavy in the air, mixed with the sharp tang of metal and oil, a familiar aroma that filled my nostrils and clung to my clothes like a second skin. The road stretched on, mile after mile, the monotony broken only by the occasional flicker of a passing street lamp or the distant glow of headlights on the horizon. But as the night wore on, a sense of unease settled over me, a weird feeling of dangers, unseen, lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. My hands tightened on the steering wheel, knuckles white with tension as I scanned the darkness for any sign of trouble. And then, I saw it, a figure standing by the side of the road, surrounded by darkness, their silhouette barely visible in the dim glow of my headlights. My heart skipped a beat as I approached, my foot easing off the accelerator as I slowed to a stop beside them. The figure stepped forward, their features hidden in the shadows, as they reached out a hand in silent plea. With a pang of guilt, I hesitated. Should I offer them a ride, or drive on, and leave them to the mercy of the night? But before I could make a decision, the figure spoke, a voice soft and pleading, tinged with desperation. They were lost, they said, stranded on the side of the road, with no way home. Could I help them, just this once? Against my better judgment, I nodded, my heart softening at the thought of leaving them alone in the darkness. Opening the door of my rig, I gestured for them to climb inside, the scent of rain and earth mingling with the stale air of the cabin as they settled into the passenger seat beside me. As we drove on, the silence of the night hugged us like a heavy blanket broken only by the low hum of the engine and the occasional crackle of the radio. The figure beside me sat in silence, their presence a looming shadow in the confined space of the cabin. But as we neared our destination, a sense of unease settled over me once more, a nagging feeling that something was not quite right, a creeping sense of dread that clawed at the edges of my consciousness. And then, without warning, the figure beside me spoke, a voice cold and hollow, devoid of the warmth and humanity I had heard before. They thanked me for my kindness, they said, their words dripping with malice and menace. With a start, I realized the truth. The figure beside me was not human, but something far more sinister a creature of the night masquerading in human form. Panic surged through me like a tidal wave as I slammed on the brakes, the screech of tires on pavement echoing in the night. But it was too late. The figure beside me lunged forward, their true form revealed in a flash of fangs and claws as they reached for me with outstretched hands. With a cry of terror, I fought back my fists pounding against their twisted flesh in a desperate bid for survival. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The creature lay sprawled on the floor of the cabin, its form twisted and broken, its lifeblood pooling beneath it in a dark puddle on the floor. Shaking with adrenaline and fear, I stumbled out of the rig and into the cool night air the scent of rain and earth mingling with the coppery tang of blood as I gasped for breath, my heart pounding in my chest like a drumbeat of terror. But as I stood there, trembling and alone on the side of the highway, I knew that my ordeal was far from over, that the darkness that lurked in the shadows would always be waiting, ready to claim its next victim in the dead of night.
The fluorescent lights overhead cast a harsh glow over the aisles of Walmart, illuminating row upon row of merchandise with an unnatural brilliance. The familiar scent of artificial air fresheners mixed with the overpowering aroma of freshly baked goods, creating an unsettling contrast to the tense atmosphere that lingered in the store. I had come to Walmart for a simple shopping trip, a few groceries, maybe some household essentials, but as I made my way through the crowded aisles, a feeling of unease settled over me. I could feel it in my bones that something wasn't right. The air seemed heavier here, tinged with an undercurrent of tension that prickled at the edges of my consciousness. I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself that it was just my imagination running wild. But as I wandered deeper into the aisles, the sense of dread only grew stronger, like a weight pressing down on my chest. And then, the lights flickered overhead, casting the store into darkness for a brief moment before springing back to life. I glanced around nervously, but no one else seemed to have noticed, a fact that only served to heighten my sense of isolation. With a shaky breath, I continued on my way, my footsteps echoing in the empty silence as I made my way towards the grocery section. But as I turned down one particularly dark aisle, I felt a chill run down my spine, a feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes tracking my every move. I paused, my heart pounding in my chest, and glanced around nervously, but the aisle was deserted. I tried to shake off the feeling, chalking it up to nerves, but as I continued on my way, my feeling of unease only grew stronger. And then, just as I was about to turn back, I heard it, a soft, whispered voice drifting through the darkness, barely audible over the hum of the fluorescent lights. I froze, my blood turning to ice as the words registered in my mind, a single, chilling phrase that sent shivers down my spine. Come find me. With a surge of adrenaline, I turned and fled, my footsteps echoing in the empty silence as I raced towards the checkout lanes. But no matter how fast I ran, the voice seemed to follow me, growing louder and more insistent with each passing moment. I rounded a corner, my breath coming in ragged gasps, and skidded to a halt as I found myself face to face with a figure lurking in the shadows. A tall, shadowy figure with eyes that gleamed with an otherworldly light. With a cry of terror, I stumbled backwards, my heart pounding in my chest as I backed away from the creature. But it only advanced towards me, its movements fluid and graceful as it closed in on me with unnerving speed. Desperate, I reached out for anything that could be used as a weapon my fingers closing around a can of soup on the nearby shelf. With a trembling hand, I held it up in the air, attempting to scare the creature, hoping to fend it off long enough to make my escape. But the creature only laughed, a low, guttural sound that sent chills down my spine. As it lunged forward, its claws slashing through the air with deadly precision. With a cry of despair, I swung the can of soup with all my strength, striking the creature squarely in the face. To my surprise, the creature recoiled, its grip loosening as it stumbled backwards in pain. Seizing my opportunity, I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest as I raced towards the exit, the sounds of the creature's enraged cries echoing in my ears. As I burst out into the safety of the parking lot, Gasping for breath and trembling with fear, I knew that I had narrowly escaped death. I knew I had to get out of there and never return to that Walmart again. It's been a while since I've last gone grocery shopping. The haunting memories of that incident will forever be etched into my brain like a tattoo. Daniel's body convulsed, and he let out a guttural scream. His skin began to ripple and shift, his features contorting in a grotesque display. 
The guests gasped in horror, their faces pale with fear. I watched in stunned disbelief as Daniel's form twisted and morphed, his human features melting away to reveal something monstrous. His eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and his skin turned a sickly shade of gray. His fingers elongated into sharp, claw-like appendages, and his teeth grew into jagged fangs. No, I screamed, stumbling backward. This can't be real. The figure's voice echoed in my mind, a sinister whisper that sent chills down my spine. He has deceived you, bride. He is a creature of darkness, a demon in disguise. Tears streamed down my face as I looked at the monster that had once been Daniel. The scent of decay was overpowering, filling my nostrils and making me gag. My heart shattered, the realization of the truth cutting through me like a knife. Daniel, or whatever he truly was, reached out to me, his eyes filled with desperation. Please forgive me, he begged, his voice a distorted echo of the man I had once loved. I didn't want this. I never wanted to hurt you, but it was too late. The figure raised its hand, and Daniel was engulfed in a blinding light. His screams echoed through the cathedral, mingling with the cries of the terrified guests. I covered my ears, my body trembling with fear and sorrow. When the light faded, Daniel was gone. The cathedral was silent, the fog dissipating as quickly as it had appeared. The figure turned to me, its eyes piercing through my soul. You have been spared, it said, its voice a haunting melody. But the darkness lingers. Be wary, bride, for the shadows are ever watchful. With that, the figure vanished, leaving me standing alone at the altar. The scent of roses and lilies was now tinged with the acrid smell of fear and decay. The guests slowly began to stir, their faces etched with confusion and horror. I fell to my knees, the weight of the truth crashing down upon me. My wedding day had turned into a nightmare. The man I loved revealed to be a monster. The cathedral, once a place of joy and celebration, was now a tomb of shattered dreams and broken promises. As the days turned into weeks, the memory of that fateful day haunted me. The scent of roses and lilies, once so comforting, now filled me with dread. I couldn't escape the feeling that I was being watched, that the darkness was still lurking, waiting to claim me. The whispers began soon after, faint at first, but growing louder with each passing night. They filled my mind with a sinister chorus, a reminder of the horrors I had witnessed. The scent of decay lingered in the air, a constant reminder of the darkness that had touched my life. I knew I could never truly escape the shadows. They were a part of me now, a constant presence that haunted my every waking moment. The figure's words echoed in my mind, a chilling reminder that the darkness was ever watchful. My life had been irrevocably changed, my dreams shattered by the revelation of the truth. The man I had loved was gone replaced by a monster that had deceived me. The cathedral, once a symbol of hope and happiness, was now a place of terror and despair. I could only hope that one day I would find a way to banish the darkness and reclaim the light. But until then, I would live in the shadow of my wedding day, haunted by the memory of the man I had once loved and the nightmare that had torn us apart. For in the end, the darkness is always there, lurking just beyond the edge of the light, waiting to claim those who dare to venture into its depths. And I had ventured too far, losing myself in the shadows, forever changed by the horrors I had witnessed on that fateful day. The winter night draped its icy tendrils over the quiet town, the moon casting haunting shadows upon the snow-covered streets. As I sat by the fireplace, seeking warmth from the biting cold, a sharp knock shattered the quietness, echoing through the empty house. It was well past midnight, and the thought of visitors at such an hour sent a shiver down my spine. With caution, I approached the door, met with the frigid air of the winter night. No one at the door but a small envelope left on the doorstep. 
I tore it open, revealing a single, chilling message. Will you survive the night? Dread settled like a heavy blanket over me as I read the ominous words, my heart hammering in my chest. Before I could process the meaning behind the sinister note, the lights flickered and died, leaving me engulfed in darkness. Panic seized me as I fumbled for a flashlight, the scent of fear thick in the air. The darkness pressed in around me, suffocating and oppressive, as if the very night itself conspired against me. With each passing moment, the air grew colder, sending shivers racing down my spine. I was alone, stranded in the black abyss, with only the echo of my own heartbeat for company. Suddenly, a sound shattered the silence, a faint scratching at the window. My breath caught in my throat as I crept toward the source of the noise. Through the frosted glass, I caught sight of a shadowy figure lurking outside in the cold darkness. With trembling hands, I reached for the phone, only to find it dead in my grasp. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I was utterly alone, at the mercy of whatever malevolent force lurked in the night. As the hours dragged on, the darkness seemed to take on a life of its own. Shadows danced upon the walls, casting shapes that seemed to leer at me from the depths of the abyss. The scent of dread hung heavy in the air, thick and suffocating. And then, just as the night reached its darkest hour, a sound echoed through the stillness, a heavy thud against the door. My heart felt like it lunged out of my chest as I watched in horror the feeling of terror mixed with the bitter cold of the night. With a trembling hand, I reached for the door, my pulse pounding in my ears. As I flung it open, a man bolted towards me, his face hidden by the darkness. Panic surged through me as he lunged forward, intent on breaking into my house. In a desperate bid for survival, I slammed the door shut, trapping his arm in the doorframe. The man howled in pain, his cries echoing through the night, but I refused to let him. With each passing moment, the struggle intensified. Driven by sheer instinct, I reached for my car keys, the metal biting into my skin as I plunged them into the man's flesh. He recoiled in agony, his eyes wild with terror, before finally retreating into the darkness from where he came. As the first light of dawn broke over the horizon, Casting its golden glow upon the snow-covered landscape, I breathed a sigh of relief. The darkness receded, chased away by the warmth of the morning sun, and I knew that I had survived the night, and whatever twisted games the man had thrown my way. The night was thick with fog as I drove down the deserted country road. The dim glow of my headlights barely piercing the darkness that cloaked me like a suffocating blanket. The air was heavy with the smell of damp earth, the ominous atmosphere weighing heavily on my shoulders as I navigated the winding path ahead. I had taken a wrong turn, a simple mistake that would soon lead me down a path of terror and madness. As I pressed on, my heart pounding in my chest, a feeling of unease settled over me like a crashing wave. The road stretched out before me, its twists and turns shrouded in shadows, each corner holding the promise of untold horrors lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. And then I saw it, a figure standing in the middle of the road, its form obscured by the fog, its eyes gleaming with an otherworldly light. Panic surged through my veins as I slammed on the brakes, the screech of tires echoing in the stillness of the night as I skidded to a halt. For a moment, I sat frozen in terror, my eyes locked with those of the mysterious figure that stood before me. And then, as if by some cruel twist of fate, it vanished into thin air, leaving behind nothing but the echo of its eerie presence. With trembling hands, I forced myself to continue down the road. 
the memory of the encounter burning like a brand into my mind. But no matter how far I drove, the figure seemed to haunt me at every turn, appearing and disappearing with each passing moment like a specter from beyond the grave. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, that there was a rational explanation for this creepy occurrence. For some reason, I am imagining that a dark figure had appeared before me on an empty road. Maybe I was sleep deprived or bored. My mind was playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew that something was terribly wrong. That I had stumbled upon something far more sinister than I could have ever imagined. As the night wore on, the figure became more persistent its ghostly presence growing ever more menacing with each passing encounter. No matter how fast I drove or how many turns I took, it was always there, lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. Desperation gnawed at my insides as I struggled to make sense of the nightmare that had consumed me. I could feel my sanity slipping away, the boundaries between reality and delusion blurring with each passing moment as the figure continued to haunt my every move. And then, in a moment of madness born of desperation, I made a decision that would change everything. With a roaring scream of anguish, I slammed my foot down on the gas, the engine roaring to life as I hurtled down the road in reverse, following the same path I had taken before. The world blurred into a whirlwind of motion as I raced through the night, the wind howling in my ears like a chorus of demons as I tore through the darkness. Every fiber of my being screamed for release, for escape from the nightmare that had become my reality. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. With a final screech of tires, I came to a stop, the world around me spinning in dizzying circles as I struggled to catch my breath. And then, as if by some miracle, the fog lifted, the darkness receding like a tide as the first light of dawn crept over the horizon. As I stumbled from the car, my limbs trembling with exhaustion, I knew that I had broken the curse that had held me captive in its grasp. The figure was gone, banished back to the depths of the night from whence it came, and I was free, at last, free from the nightmare that had threatened to consume me whole. And though the memory of that fateful night would haunt me for the rest of my days, I took comfort in the knowledge that I had emerged from the darkness stronger than ever before. For sometimes, it is only in facing our deepest fears that we find the strength to overcome them, to emerge from the darkness into the light, forever changed but determined, ready to face whatever horrors the world may throw our way. The 4th of July had always been my favorite holiday. The smell of barbecue, the sound of laughter, and the sight of fireworks lighting up the night sky, it all felt like a celebration of life and freedom. It was like any other Independence Day. The sun was high in the sky, and the air was filled with the scent of grilled meat. I could hear children's laughter as they played with sparklers. My friends and I had planned to drive out to the old abandoned fairground on the edge of town. It was a place of local legend, said to be haunted by the ghosts of those who had died in a tragic accident decades ago. We thought it would be fun to spend the night there before watching the fireworks to give ourselves a little scare. The air was thick with the humidity and decaying wood. The place felt forgotten, lost to time. We parked the car and stepped out. Are you sure this is a good idea? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Come on, it's just for fun, my friend Mike said, grinning. What's the worst that could happen? We traveled deeper into the fairground, past rusted rides and broken down stalls. The atmosphere grew heavier, the air colder. My skin prickled with unease, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. The sky began to darken, 
the sun started setting. As we explored, I caught a whiff of something foul, like rotting garbage. I wrinkled my nose, trying to ignore the nauseating smell. We found the old Ferris wheel, its metal frame creaking in the wind. Suddenly, a chill ran down my spine, and I felt an overwhelming urge to leave. We should go, I said, my voice trembling. Before anyone could respond, a loud crash echoed through the air, followed by a series of drunken shouts. At first, I thought it was fireworks, but the sound was too close, too aggressive. Then, the screaming started. My heart pounded in my chest as I turned to see a figure stumbling out of the shadows, a man with wild eyes and a bottle in his hand. Panic surged through me, and I instinctively ducked behind a nearby stall. The air was thick with the acrid smell of alcohol, mixing with the sickly sweet scent of decay. We need to get out of here, I shouted, my voice barely audible over the chaos. My friends scattered, running in all directions. I could hear their frantic footsteps, their desperate cries. The drunkard's laughter echoed through the fairground, a chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. I crawled on my hands and knees, trying to stay hidden, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. As I made my way towards the exit, I stumbled upon Mike, crouching behind a cotton candy cart. My stomach churned, and I felt bile rise in my throat. I wanted to scream, to cry, but there was no time. I had to keep moving. The smell of smoke filled the air as fires broke out around us, the dry wood of the old structures catching quickly. I could see the flicker of flames, feel the intense heat on my skin. My eyes stung with smoke and I struggled to breathe, coughing as I stumbled forward. I found myself at the edge of the fairground near the entrance. I could hear sirens in the distance, growing louder. Relief washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by a new fear. The drunk man was still out there, and I wasn't safe yet. I ducked behind a ticket booth, my heart pounding in my chest. The smell of burnt popcorn and hot metal filled my nostrils. I peered out trying to see where the drunkard was, but the smoke and darkness made it difficult. Suddenly he appeared just a few feet away. His eyes were wild, his face twisted in a maniacal grin. He raised his bottle, slurring curses and threats. Time seemed to slow down, and I felt a cold wave of dread wash over me. In that moment, the first firework of the night exploded in the sky, a brilliant burst of red, white, and blue. The drunkard's attention shifted for a split second, distracted by the noise and light. I seized the opportunity bolting from my hiding place and running towards the flashing lights of the approaching police cars. Help! Over here! I screamed, waving my arms frantically. The officers saw me and rushed forward, their shouts blending with the crackle of fireworks and the roar of flames. They apprehended the drunk man, his crazed laughter turning into incoherent mumbling. As they led him away, I collapsed to the ground, my body trembling with relief and exhaustion. The rest of the night passed in a blur. My friends were found and taken to the hospital, some shaken but thankfully uninjured. The fairground was a smoldering ruin, the smell of burnt wood and scorched earth lingering in the air. As I stood there watching the final firework burst into a dazzling display of red, white, and blue, and I felt a surge of pride swell in my chest. We had faced a nightmare and come out the other side. In that moment, I knew that no matter what horrors we might face, the spirit of freedom and resilience that defined our nation. Working the graveyard shift at Moe's Diner was usually uneventful. The familiar aroma of coffee brewing and bacon frying in the back was my nightly comfort. It was just past midnight when he walked in. Tall, lanky, with wild eyes and disheveled clothes, he looked like he hadn't slept in days. The sour, pungent odor that clung to him made my stomach turn. Hey there, he rasped. Got any coffee? Sure thing, I replied, forcing a smile. As I poured him a fresh cup, the rich aroma temporarily masked his stench. 
Rough night? You could say that. He took a long sip, his eyes darting around the diner. There was something about him that set my nerves on edge. What's your name? I asked, trying to keep the conversation light. Jake, he said after a pause, his gaze locking onto mine with an unsettling intensity. Nice to meet you, Jake. I'm Sam. You passing through? Yeah, just needed a break, he replied, his eyes flicking towards the door every few seconds. We made small talk, but his answers were curt and vague. The smell of him was becoming unbearable, and just as I was about to ask if he wanted something to eat, I heard the distant sound of sirens. Jake's eyes widened, his grip on the coffee mug tightening. The sirens grew louder, sending a chill down my spine. The regulars in the corner looked up, puzzled. What's going on? One of them asked. I didn't know. I walked to the window and saw police cars surrounding the diner. Officers, guns drawn, positioned themselves around the entrance. I turned back to Jake, my pulse quickening. What's happening? I whispered. Before he could answer, the door swung open and a police officer stepped inside. Everyone, stay calm. We're looking for an escaped convict. He's dangerous. Jake stood up abruptly, knocking over his mug. Coffee spilled across the counter, mingling with the smell of his sweat and the metallic scent of fear. Jake, sit down, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. But Jake's eyes were wild with panic. I can't go back, he muttered, more to himself than to me. I won't go back. In an instant, he lunged at me, his hands reaching for my throat. The world seemed to slow down. All I could think about was his sour smell and the desperation in his eyes. I stumbled back fear gripping me. Before he could reach me, the police swarmed in. They tackled him to the ground, pinning him down with practiced efficiency. The regulars watched in stunned silence. The diner was filled with the sounds of grunts, the clinking of handcuffs, and the smell of sweat and fear. Jake struggled against the officers, his face contorted with rage and desperation. You don't understand, he screamed. I had no choice. They made me do it. The officers ignored his pleas, hauling him to his feet and dragging him toward the door. One of them turned to me, his expression softening. Are you all right? I nodded, my hands still trembling. Yeah, I think so. Good. We'll need you to give a statement, he said. Is there anyone else here? Just a couple of regulars, I replied, my voice shaky. The officer nodded and motioned for his colleagues to secure the area. The tension in the diner began to dissipate, replaced by a lingering unease. The smell of fear and sweat still hung in the air, mingling with the familiar scents of coffee and bacon. As they led Jake out, he turned to me, his eyes filled with a mix of anger and sorrow. Remember what I said, Sam? They made me do it. It's not over. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I watched as he was shoved into the back of a police car. The officers began to disperse, some staying behind to take statements and secure the scene. I sat down at the counter, trying to process what had just happened. The smell of coffee was comforting, but the events of the night had left a mark on me. The regulars came over, their faces filled with concern. You okay, Sam? One of them asked. Yeah, I replied, forcing a smile. Just another night at Moe's Diner, right? They chuckled, but the laughter was strained. Tonight was different. The smell of fear and the memory of Jake's wild eyes would haunt me for a long time. As I cleaned up the spilled coffee and tried to restore some sense of normalcy, I couldn't shake the feeling that Jake's warning was more than just the ravings of a desperate man. The night began with excitement. I had been looking forward to the horror movie premiere for weeks. As I stepped into the old movie theater, the scent of buttery popcorn mingled with the faint mustiness of aged carpets and seats. The theater was one of those classic, almost regal venues with high ceilings, ornate moldings, and heavy red velvet curtains. It had seen better days, but it still held a certain charm I bought my ticket and grabbed a large tub of popcorn. 
the buttery aroma filling my nostrils as I made my way to the screening room. The theater was dimly lit, the only illumination coming from the red emergency exit signs and the flickering advertisements on the screen. I found a seat in the middle, perfectly positioned for the best view. The room slowly filled with other moviegoers, their chatter creating a low hum of anticipation. As the lights dimmed further, a hush fell over the crowd. The preview started and I settled into my seat, the plush fabric slightly worn but still comfortable. I could feel the slight stickiness of the floor beneath my shoes, remnants of countless spilled sodas and dropped candy. As the main feature began, the air grew colder, the scent of popcorn now mixed with an inexplicable chill. I pulled my jacket tighter around me, trying to shake off the sudden unease that had settled over me. The movie was intense, full of jump scares and eerie music that sent shivers down my spine. I could feel my heart racing, my palms growing sweaty as the tension built. About halfway through the film, during a particularly quiet scene, I heard a faint whisper behind me. I turned, expecting to see someone talking, but the seats were empty. Puzzled, I shrugged it off and turned back to the screen, but the whispering continued, growing louder and more insistent. It sounded like a multitude of voices, overlapping in a cacophony of hushed tones. My pulse quickened, and I glanced around, trying to locate the source of the whispers. To my horror, I noticed that the people around me seemed oblivious, their eyes glued to the screen. It was as if I was the only one who could hear it. The voices grew louder, more distinct, filled with words I couldn't understand, but their urgency was unmistakable. Suddenly the screen flickered and the film stopped. The theater was plunged into darkness and a collective gasp rose from the audience. The emergency lights flickered on, casting a ghostly glow over the room. The whispers were now deafening, surrounding me, echoing in my ears. I stood up, my heart pounding and looked around frantically. Then, I saw it. A figure at the back of the theater, shrouded in shadow. It moved slowly, deliberately, its eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. The whispers seemed to emanate from it, growing louder with each step it took towards me. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead, and my breath came in short, panicked gasps. The figure continued to advance, and I could now make out its features. Its face was twisted into a grotesque mask of malevolence, eyes sunken and hollow. The air grew colder still, and I could see my breath misting in front of me. The smell of decay filled my nostrils, a putrid, sickening scent that made my stomach churn. I backed away, stumbling over the seats, my eyes never leaving the advancing figure. I could feel the cold seeping into my bones, a paralyzing chill that made it hard to move. The whispers turned into a chorus of anguished wails, and I clamped my hands over my ears, desperate to block out the sound. I reached the aisle and bolted for the exit, my heart hammering in my chest. The door seemed impossibly far away, and I could hear the figure's footsteps behind me, slow and deliberate. The smell of decay grew stronger, and I gagged, fighting the urge to vomit. I reached the door and pushed it open, the cold night air hitting me like a slap in the face. I stumbled outside, gasping for breath the whispers finally fading into the night. I looked back, expecting to see the figure following me, but the doorway was empty, the theater silent and still. Shaking, I made my way to my car, my mind racing. The air outside was fresh, the scent of pine trees and damp earth a welcome relief from the stench of decay. As I drove home, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the figure was still out there, waiting. That night, I lay in bed, unable to sleep. The events of the evening replayed in my mind, and I could still hear the faint whispers echoing in my ears. The smell of decay lingered, a phantom scent that refused to dissipate. As the years passed, the theater was eventually demolished, replaced by a shiny new multiplex. But I never forgot the smell of decay, 
the cold chill of the air and the whispers that seem to come from another world. The plan was simple, enjoy a weekend camping trip. We drove up to the national park, our car loaded with camping supplies. We set up our tents in a clearing surrounded by tall pines, the ground beneath us soft with needles. The air was cool and crisp, carrying the faint scent of wildflowers. We gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, while the fire burned, we cooked our dinner over the flames. After eating, we settled around the fire, telling stories and laughing. The flames kept us warm from the chilly night air. The forest was alive with sounds, crickets chirping, leaves rustling in the breeze, and the occasional hoot of an owl. Around midnight, we decided to turn in. I crawled into my tent, the smell of smoke clinging to my clothes. I lay in my sleeping bag, listening to the sounds of the forest. The air inside the tent was cold, and I could see my breath as I exhaled. I was drifting off to sleep when I heard it. Faint footsteps coming from the edge of the campsite. My eyes snapped open, and I lay still, straining to hear over the pounding of my heart. The footsteps came again, louder this time. I could smell something strange now, a musky, almost rotten odor. I unzipped my tent, just enough to look one eye out. The fire had died down to glowing embers, casting an eerie red light across the clearing. I saw movement near the trees, a shadowy figure just beyond the reach of the light. The footsteps stopped, replaced by an unnatural silence. I felt a surge of fear, my mouth dry and my hands trembling. Mark? Lisa? I whispered, hoping they were awake and had heard it too. There was no response. I glanced over at their tents. They were zipped up tight. I considered waking them but hesitated, not wanting to panic them if it was just an animal. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of my tent, the cold night air biting at my skin. I pointed the flashlight toward the trees and my blood ran cold. Standing at the edge of the clearing was a figure unlike anything I had ever seen. It was tall, unnaturally so, with limbs that seemed too long for its body. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones, and its eyes glowed with an eerie light. The creature let out a loud growl. I took a step back, my legs shaking. The air seemed to thicken and it was hard to breathe. The smell of the musky creature was suffocating. In a flash, the creature moved, darting closer to the tents. I stumbled backward, nearly dropping the flashlight. The creature's eyes locked onto mine, and I felt a chill run through my entire body. It was as if it was looking into my very soul. The forest around me seemed to blur, and all I could focus on were those glowing eyes. Mark, Lisa, wake up, I shouted my voice shaking with fear. Their tents rustled and I heard muffled voices as they woke up. The creature turned its head toward the sound and I seized the moment. I grabbed a burning stick from the fire pit and thrust it toward the creature. The flames flared and the smell of burning wood filled the air. The creature hissed, a sound like steam escaping from a boiling pot and recoiled from the fire. It backed away, its eyes never leaving mine. Mark and Lisa stumbled out of their tents, their faces pale with confusion and fear. What the hell is that? Mark shouted, his voice trembling. I don't know. We need to get out of here, I yelled back, the fear in my voice unmistakable. We grabbed our backpacks and ran, not bothering to pack up the tents. The creature's growls followed us as we fled through the forest, the stench of the musky creaturing lingering in the air. The trees seemed to close in around us, and the darkness was nearly impenetrable. My heart pounded in my chest, and my lungs burned from the exertion. We finally reached the car, and I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably. We piled in, and I started the engine, the headlights cutting through the darkness. I glanced back toward the forest and didn't see the creature. We sped away. My mind raced, replaying the encounter over and over, we didn't stop driving until we reached the safety of the city. We agreed never to speak of what had happened, 
but the memory stayed with me, haunting my dreams. The snow fell gently from the sky, covering our neighborhood in a blanket of white. My friends and I couldn't wait for the first big snowfall of the year. The air was crisp, and I could smell the fresh, clean scent of snow mixed with the faint aroma of pine trees. We gathered at the park, our laughter echoing in the cold air as we started our snowball fight. The snow was perfect for packing, and I formed a solid snowball feeling the icy chill seep into my gloves. My friend Mike was ducking behind a tree, laughing as he lobbed snowballs in my direction. I took aim, intending to hit him square in the back, but my throw went wide. The snowball sailed past Mike and struck a passing car with a loud thud. The car screeched to a halt, and I saw a cracked spider across the windshield where my snowball had hit. Panic surged through me, and I turned to my friends. Run, I yelled my voice trembling with fear. We scattered, our feet slipping on the icy ground as we sprinted away. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel the cold air burning in my lungs. I didn't dare look back, but I could hear the car door slam and the crunch of boots on snow as the driver gave chase. We managed to lose him in the maze of backyards and alleys, finally collapsing on the ground behind Mike's garage. Our breaths were ragged, and our faces were flushed with cold and adrenaline. We laughed nervously, trying to shake off the fear. That night, we got online to play video games, hoping to distract ourselves from what happened earlier that day. Suddenly, Mike went silent. One moment he was laughing, the next, nothing. Mike, you there? I asked. There was no response. The game showed he was still online but he wasn't moving or talking. My heart skipped a beat, and I felt a cold knot form in my stomach. Mike, come on, this isn't funny, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Still nothing. I glanced at the chat window, seeing our other friends typing similar messages. The minutes ticked by, each one stretching longer than the last. The uneasy feeling grew stronger, and I could feel my palms growing sweaty despite the cold. Suddenly, Mike's screen went dark, and his avatar disappeared from the game. The chat window filled with concerned messages, but there was no response from Mike. I tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. I could feel my pulse quicken, and a cold sweat broke out on my forehead. Something was wrong, very wrong. The next morning, I learned that Mike was missing. His parents had come home to find the back door wide open snow tracked through the house. The police were called, but there was no sign of him. My friends and I were questioned, but we had no answers to give. Days turned into weeks, and there was still no sign of Mike. The neighborhood was gripped by fear, and I could see the worry in everyone's eyes. The smell of snow and pine, once comforting, now felt oppressive, a constant reminder of that fateful day. One night, unable to sleep, I sat by my window, staring out at the snow-covered street. The world was silent, the only sound, the faint rustle of branches in the wind. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the man from the car was still out there, waiting. Suddenly, my phone rang. I jumped, the sound slicing through the tense silence. I glanced at the screen and saw Mike's name. Relief flooded through me as I answered. Mike, what happened? You scared us, I said, my voice shaking with a mixture of anger and relief. But the voice on the other end wasn't Mike's. It was deeper, rougher, filled with a chilling calmness. You should have apologized, the voice said. The blood drained from my face and my heart pounded in my chest. It was the man from the car. My hand trembled as I gripped the phone, my mind racing. I hung up, my heart racing. I knew then that I was next. The next day, I vanished, leaving behind only the memory of a snowball fight that had gone horribly wrong. The man from the car had gotten his revenge, and I was never seen or heard from again until now.
Urban exploration was my thrill. The adrenaline rush of sneaking into places long forgotten, it was intoxicating. Tonight I was venturing into the old Willowbrook Asylum, a place infamous for its dark history and alleged hauntings. I arrived at the asylum just after midnight, the air crisp and biting against my skin. The smell of damp earth and decaying wood filled my nostrils as I approached the entrance. The towering, ivy-covered walls towered over me, their shadows stretching along the moonlight path. I slipped through a gap in the rusted iron gate and made my way to the main building. The heavy wooden door creaked open with a groan that echoed through the empty halls. I stepped inside. Each step I took stirred up a cloud of dust that tickled my nose and throat. The beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, revealing peeling wallpaper, broken furniture, and scattered debris. My footsteps echoed in the vast emptiness, amplifying the sense of isolation. The asylum had been abandoned for decades, yet it felt like something was still lurking in the shadows, watching me. I wandered through the halls, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and fear. The stories about this place were unsettling, patients mistreated, mysterious deaths, and ghost sightings. But I had never encountered anything paranormal in my explorations before, and part of me hoped tonight would be different. As I ventured deeper into the asylum, the air grew colder and the smells more pungent. The stench of decay became overpowering, making me gag. I pulled my gas mask up over my nose, trying to filter out the worst of it. The oppressive atmosphere seemed to press down on me, the silence almost deafening. I entered a room that appeared to have been a dorm. Rusty bed frames lined the walls, their mattresses long gone. The floor was littered with yellowed papers and broken glass. As I scanned the room, something caught my eye, a dark stain on the far wall. I approached it the beam of my flashlight revealing a smeared, hand-shaped mark. My heart dropped to my stomach when I realized it was dried blood. A sudden noise made me jump, a soft, shuffling sound coming from the hallway. I turned off my flashlight and pressed myself against the wall, holding my breath. The shuffling grew louder, closer. My heart raced, every instinct screaming at me to run, but I froze. The sound stopped just outside the door. I strained my ears, trying to make out any other noises. After what felt like an eternity, I slowly peeked around the corner. The hallway was empty, but the uneasy feeling remained. I turned my flashlight back on and decided it was time to leave. Whatever was here, I didn't want to meet it. I retraced my steps, moving quickly but cautiously. My breath came out in visible puffs, and I shivered uncontrollably. As I neared the entrance, I heard it again, the shuffling sound, but this time it was accompanied by a faint whispering. I started to panic. I started running, the beam of my flashlight bouncing wildly. My imagination made up images of the asylum's former patients, their spirits trapped in this place of suffering. I reached the entrance and pushed through the door, the fresh air hitting me like a slap in the face. I stumbled outside, gasping for breath, the whispers fading out. I didn't stop running until I was back in my car. As I drove away, my hands shook on the steering wheel. I had always loved the thrill of urban exploration, but tonight had been different. Tonight, I had encountered something I couldn't explain, something that had left me questioning the safety of my favorite hobby. The asylum remained a dark silhouette in my rearview mirror, its secrets hidden in the shadows. I knew I would never return, but the memory of that night would haunt me forever. The carnival lights flickered against the dark sky, casting a colorful glow over the crowd. The air was thick with the smell of popcorn and cotton candy. I had always loved carnivals, somewhat magical escape from the everyday world. I wandered through the crowd, taking in the sights and sounds. The rides whirred and clanked, lights flashing in dizzying patterns. I decided to try my luck at one of the game booths, a row of stuffed animals dangling enticingly from the ceiling. Step right up, win a prize, 
the barker called, his voice booming over the noise. I handed over a few dollars and picked up the ring toss game. The rings were heavier than I expected, and I missed the target completely. The barker laughed good-naturedly and handed me another ring. Give it another go, kid, he said with a wink. I took a deep breath and tossed the ring. It clinked against the bottle, wobbling before falling to the ground. I sighed in frustration, but the barker smiled. Almost had it. Here, one more on the house, he said pressing a final ring into my hand. I focused, determined to win this time. As I threw the ring, something caught my eye, a flash of movement in the shadows behind the booth. The ring missed again, and I turned to look, but whatever it was had vanished. Better luck next time, the barker said, his smile fading as he noticed my distraction. Yeah, thanks, I muttered, backing away from the booth. I wandered through the carnival, the sense of unease growing. The cheerful lights and sounds seemed to take on a sinister edge. The laughter too loud, the lights too bright. I shook my head, trying to dispel the feeling. It was just a carnival, after all. I found myself drawn to the Ferris wheel, its massive, illuminated wheel turning slowly against the night sky. The line was short, and I climbed into one of the brightly colored cars, the smell of grease and metal filling the air. As the wheel began to turn, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. The view from the top was breathtaking, the carnival laid out like a glowing tapestry below. As my car reached the highest point, I noticed something strange. In the distance, beyond the carnival grounds, was a dark, sprawling forest. And in the forest, just visible in the fading light, was a small, dilapidated building. It looked out of place a stark contrast to the vibrant carnival. A sense of foreboding settled over me, and I shivered despite the warm night. The Ferris wheel continued its slow rotation, and as I descended, I saw something even more disturbing. Standing at the edge of the carnival, just where the forest began, was a figure. It was tall and thin, its features obscured by the shadows. It seemed to be watching me, its eyes glinting in the carnival lights. I looked around, but no one else seemed to notice the figure. The Ferris wheel came to a stop, and I hurried off, my heart pounding. I needed to leave, to get away from whatever was lurking at the edge of the carnival. I made my way through the crowd, the smell of sweat and fried food overwhelming. I glanced back toward the forest, but the figure was gone. I told myself it was just my imagination, the result of too much excitement and too little sleep. But the sense of unease persisted, gnawing at the edges of my mind. I decided to take one last walk through the carnival before leaving. I passed the fun house, its garish exterior flickering in the dim light. A sign above the entrance read, Enter if you dare. The letters painted in dripping, blood-red strokes. Against my better judgment, I stepped inside. The air was cool and musty, the smell of old wood and stale popcorn permeating the darkness. The mirrors warped my reflection, twisting my features into grotesque shapes. I walked through the maze, my footsteps echoing in the empty space. As I turned a corner, I saw it again, the tall, thin figure standing at the end of the corridor. It was closer now, its eyes glowing in the dim light. I froze, my heart hammering in my chest. The figure began to move toward me, its steps slow and deliberate. I backed away, my mind racing. I had to get out to escape this nightmare. I turned and ran, the sound of my footsteps drowned out by the pounding of my heart. I burst out of the fun house, the cool night air a stark contrast to the stifling darkness inside. I looked around, but the figure was nowhere to be seen. The carnival seemed normal again, the lights and sounds cheerful and inviting. I hurried to my car, the smell of exhaust and fried food fading as I left the carnival behind. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the figure was still out there, waiting. I never went back to that carnival, and every time I see a carnival, I remember that night and the horror that lurked within the shadows.
The smell of motor oil and grease clung to my clothes as I wiped my hands on a dirty rag, trying to clean off the grime that never seemed to leave my skin. The mechanic shop was quiet that night, the kind of silence that made the air feel heavy, almost oppressive. The only sounds were the occasional drip of oil from a leaky pan and the low hum of the fluorescent lights that cast a sickly yellow glow over the garage. It was late, far later than I usually stayed, but there was a job I needed to finish. A black sedan had been towed in earlier with engine trouble, and the customer was desperate to have it fixed by morning. The car sat on the lift in the center of the garage, its hood propped open like a yawning mouth. I sighed, rolling my shoulders to ease the tension that had settled in after hours of bending over engines. My muscles ached, and my mind was foggy from fatigue, but I couldn't afford to leave the job unfinished. I grabbed my wrench and leaned over the engine, the metal cool and smooth in my hand. As I worked, I noticed something strange. The engine was in worse shape than I'd initially thought. Parts were corroded, wires frayed, and there was an odd sticky residue on some of the components. It didn't make sense for a car of this age and condition to be so deteriorated. I recoiled, wiping my hand on the rag, but the smell lingered, clinging to my nostrils. A shiver ran down my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, deeply wrong. The garage felt colder, the shadows longer, and the once comforting sounds of the shop now seemed ominous. I felt like I was being watched, like something or someone was just out of sight, lurking in the dark corners of the garage. I glanced around, my eyes scanning the room, but there was nothing there. Just the usual clutter of tools and equipment. The smell of decay was stronger now, almost overpowering and I could feel a cold sweat breaking out on my forehead. My hands trembled as I reached for a screwdriver, the metal slipping slightly in my grip. That's when I heard it, a faint scraping sound, like metal against concrete. My breath caught in my throat and I froze, listening. The sound came again, closer this time, followed by a soft rhythmic tapping, like someone gently knocking on a door. It was coming from the direction of the sedan. The garage was dead silent, the kind of silence that felt alive, like it was waiting for something. I stepped closer to the car, the tapping growing louder, more insistent. My hands shook as I reached for the flashlight on the workbench, the beam cutting through the darkness as I pointed it toward the engine. Something was crawling out from under the car, a long, thin arm, pale and emaciated its fingers curling and uncurling like a spider's legs. The skin was stretched tight over the bones, and the nails were cracked and yellowed. My breath stopped as more of the figure emerged, a gaunt, skeletal body dragging itself forward, its head lolling to the side as if the neck couldn't support the weight. The smell of decay was overwhelming now, choking me, making my eyes water. I stumbled back, dropping the flashlight the beam spinning wildly across the floor. The thing, whatever it was, continued to crawl out from beneath the car, its hollow eyes fixed on me, dark and empty. Get out, a voice whispered, barely audible over the pounding of my heart. It was a raspy, guttural sound like wind through dead leaves. The figure's mouth moved, the words slipping out between blackened teeth. You shouldn't be here. Leave. It rasped again its eyes boring into mine, before it's too late. My survival instincts finally kicked in, and I yanked my foot away, stumbling backward. I didn't look back as I bolted for the door, the sounds of scraping and tapping echoing in my ears. I didn't stop running until I was in my car. My hands were shaking so badly that I could barely grip the steering wheel, and my heart was racing, adrenaline pumping through my veins. The memory of that thing crawling out from under the sedan, its hollow eyes and skeletal frame, haunted me, replaying over and over in my mind. I never went back to the shop. I couldn't. The thought of stepping foot in there again, of smelling that sweet, rotting scent, filled me with an indescribable dread. I left town a few days later, leaving everything behind. But the memory of that night the horror that lurked in the shadows of the garage stayed with me. 
and every time I smell motor oil, I can't help but feel a cold shiver run down my spine, a reminder of the thing that still haunts my nightmares. The library was quiet, almost too quiet. The only sounds were the faint rustling of pages turning and the occasional creak of the old wooden floor beneath my feet. I loved the library's stillness, the way the musty scent of old books filled the air, comforting and familiar. It was a place where time seemed to stand still, where I could lose myself in the pages of a novel and forget about the outside world. That evening, I had the library almost entirely to myself. I was tucked away in a corner, a stack of books on the table in front of me, the smell of yellowed paper and aging leather filling my nostrils. I was deep into a particularly engrossing novel when I heard it, a faint whispering sound like a breeze brushing through the leaves of a tree. I paused, lifting my head to listen, but the sound was gone. Shaking it off as my imagination, I returned to my book, the words on the page pulling me back into the story. But then, the whispering came again, a soft, unintelligible murmur that sent a shiver down my spine. This time, it was closer, almost as if someone were standing right behind me, speaking in a low, breathy voice. My heart skipped a beat, and I glanced over my shoulder, half expecting to see someone there. But the aisle was empty, the dim light casting eerie shadows that seemed to flicker and shift. The smell of the old books, once comforting, now felt stifling, heavy in the air, mingling with something else. A faint, metallic odor that made my stomach turn. I couldn't place the smell, but it was out of place in the library, unnatural. The whispering came again, louder this time, almost insistent. I stood up the chair scraping against the floor with a loud screech that echoed through the empty space. My pulse quickened and I realized I was holding my breath, the silence now oppressive as if the library itself was holding its breath along with me. I tried to shake off the growing sense of unease, telling myself it was just the old building settling, but the feeling of being watched, of something unseen lurking just out of sight, was impossible to ignore. I needed to leave, to get out of there. I gathered my books with trembling hands, trying to ignore the way the shadows seemed to stretch and warp around me, the way the air seemed to thicken with each passing second. The library, once a sanctuary, now felt like a trap, the walls closing in around me. As I turned to leave, I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye, movement in one of the aisles. My heart pounded in my chest as I forced myself to look, to confront whatever it was. At first I saw nothing but rows of books, but then a figure stepped out from between the shelves, emerging from the shadows. It was a woman, or at least it had been. Her skin was pale, almost translucent, with a sickly gray hue. Her eyes were sunken, hollow, with dark circles that made her look like she hadn't slept in years. Her clothes were tattered and old-fashioned, as if she had stepped out of another time. She moved slowly, her movements jerky, unnatural, as if she were a puppet being controlled by unseen strings. Her lips moved, and I realized with a jolt of terror that the whispering had started again, but this time it was coming from her. I couldn't make out the words, but they were fast, frantic, and they grew louder and louder. I stumbled back, my mind reeling, my body frozen with fear. The air was thick with the smell of decay and copper, the whispering filling my ears, drowning out all other thoughts. She took another step toward me, her hand outstretched, fingers long and skeletal, reaching for me. The lights flickered, casting her face in sharp relief, and I saw the hunger in her hollow eyes a desperate, ravenous need that chilled me to the bone. She was close now, close enough that I could feel the cold radiating off her, a deep, unnatural cold that seemed to suck the warmth from the air. Instinct kicked in, and I turned to run, my feet pounding against the floor as I sprinted toward the exit. The whispering followed me, growing louder, more frantic, 
the words still unintelligible but filled with a desperate urgency. I burst through the library doors, the cool night air hitting me like a shock. The whispering stopped abruptly, the silence almost as jarring as the noise had been. I didn't stop running until I was outside, the library looming behind me like a dark, brooding presence. I doubled over, gasping for breath, my heart racing, my mind struggling to comprehend what had just happened. The air outside was fresh and clean, but the smell, the metallic odor, still lingered in my nostrils, a reminder of the horror I had just witnessed. I never went back to that library. I couldn't. The thought of those hollow eyes, the desperate whispering, filled me with an indescribable dread. And every time I pass by a library, I can't help but feel a cold shiver run down my spine, a reminder of the thing that still haunts my nightmares.